In this, the fifth lesson, we continue with the human eye, but now looking at the pupil reflex and certain disorders with regard to sight. When we learned about the structures and functions of the different parts of the eye, we have mentioned that the iris can control the size of the pupil. So what happens basically is when the eye looks in an environment where it is darker, we find that the pupil will dilate, meaning increase in diameter. This will allow for more light to enter the eye, and this will make vision possible in conditions of low light. However, when a person is exposed to bright light conditions, we find that the iris adjusts to cause the pupil to constrict and thus the opening is much more narrow and little light will enter into the eye. This is observable in the human eye. You'll find that the pupil, that black dot, becomes narrower, which we call constricting, that's the correct term, when it's exposed to light and in darker conditions, we find that it's dilated. The reason being is that the eye can be damaged by harsh light. So by constricting the pupil, less light will enter the eye and thus it will protect the cells of the eye. We have mentioned that the colored part of the eye is known as the iris and that is what can change the shape of the pupil. The pupil itself not being a structure but rather just being the opening within the iris through which light enters. With regards to the pupil mechanism, if, for example, a light is shined into a person's right eye, we find that the right eye will constrict and the pupil of the left eye will also constrict. So we've called this of the pupillary light reflex and they use this sometimes in sporting events. If a person has a head injury or a concussion is suspected, then they'll shine the torch into one eye and they'll see if this pupillary reflex occurs in both eyes. So what is the mechanism that brings about this change in pupil size? Basically, we need to understand that the iris is made up of two different types of muscles. They are the circular muscles, and as the name suggests, these are in a circular arrangement. So in a circle shape, we've got the circle, circular muscles, and the iris also has radial muscles. So if you know from maths, the radius is a line that comes from the center of a circle to the outside known as the circumference. So here, similarly, we've got these lines going across, which are called the radial muscles. And these two muscles work together to control the size of the pupil. We say that they are antagonistic. When the circular muscle contracts, the radial muscle will relax. And when the circular muscle relaxes, the radial muscle will contract. So in the case of bright light, we find that the circular muscles of the iris contract, making those circles smaller, and the radial muscles relax and that elongates the radial muscles. And that leads to the size of the pupil decreasing. You won't get marks for saying the size of the pupil decreases. The correct terminology is that the pupil constricts. And as a result of that, less light enters the eye. And this will allow for vision in bright light conditions and prevent excess light going into the eye. Again, if you look at the word circular muscles, be very careful because often learners confuse ciliary muscles and circular muscles. So the ciliary muscles are the ones that are joined to the suspensory ligaments and play a role in accommodation whereas the circular muscles are to do with the size of the pupil in the pupil mechanism. In dim light conditions, we find that dim light being the opposite of bright light, the opposite will occur. So here we find that the circular muscles of the iris relax while the radial muscles of the iris contract. And as a result, the circular muscles are relaxed, those circles become larger, 
the radial muscles contracting, meaning these radial muscles become shorter. And as a result, the pupil dilates. If it's dilated, more light can now enter into the eye. And as a result, a person will be able to see in conditions of dim light. An easy way to remember the difference between bright light and, and dim light and how uh, the changes occur on the iris. If you remember in grade R, you had something like this here to learn how to write the different letters of the alphabet. And they'll give you one fully formed letter and they give you dots and you should be able to form the correct letter next to that. So if a child could put all C's with the C's and R's with the R's, we'll say that that child in grade R is a bright child. So in bright light, we have a C with a C and an R with an R. R and R meaning the radial muscles will relax and C and C, the circular muscles will contract. And as a result, in bright light, we know that the pupil will constrict and less light enters into the eye. However, if we have a child who puts R's by the C's and C's by the R's, we'll say this is not the brightest child, this child is a bit dull. And in dull or dumb light, we have the letters being mixed up. R and C, the radial muscles are contracting and the circular muscles are relaxed, right? So we say the, but it's important also not to just say radial muscles and circular muscles. It's good to mention the radial muscles of the iris will contract and the circular muscles of the iris will relax. That's where we've got the letters mixed up. And D for dull light, we have the pupil D for dilating now. And that allows for more light to enter into the eye. We look at a few visual defects. One is short-sightedness. So short-sightedness means that a person is sighted for a short distance. They can see things that are close to them. However, objects that are in a far away from them or in a distance of greater than six meters, we find that those objects, they might be blurred. One cause of short-sightedness is that the eyeball is too long. So if the shape of a particular person's eyeball is longer from front to back, then when the image is formed, because the eyeball is too long, the image falls in front of the retina instead of on the retina. Or another cause can be the inability of the lens to become less convex or rounded, right? So here the lens is stuck in the shape of being more convex, which is suited for near vision. So a person can see near objects clearly, but when they look at something far, the lens is not becoming that thinner and elongated shape, which we call less convex. And as a result, there's too much of bending of the light when you look at a distant object and the image is falling in front of the retina. To resolve this, glasses are produced with biconcave lens, right? So, so these lenses are biconcave. Concave is the opposite of convex. Convex is rounded going outwards, like how the lens shape is, whereas concave is rounded going inwards. So what these lenses will do is they'll bend the light in going outwards. So when the eye overbends it inwards, it still balances up on the right place, which is in the retina. But also other options would be contact lenses or laser treatment, which can also be used as a long-term solution. So a summary there, the object that is viewed, we find that the image is landing in front of the retina instead of on the retina when you're looking at distant objects. And as a result, we're going to find that the images are not going to be clear when looking at distant vision. However, those images that are close by can be seen clearly. Certain people are long-sighted or far-sighted, meaning that they have clear vision for objects that are far away from them. However, those objects that are near to them, they find difficulty in seeing it clearly. The reason for that could be that the eyeball shape is too short. So if from front to back, it's too short, the eyeball, 
what that would mean is that when the eye does the process of refraction, the image is hypothetically falling behind the retina instead of on the retina. Right, or the second issue could be the inability of the lens to become more convex. So what happens is that the eye is stuck in the position of looking, the lens specifically, in the position of looking at distant objects. So you'll find that the lens is less convex, it's more elongated. And as a result, the amount of bending is fine for distant vision. So those objects can be seen fine. But when it comes to those images that are closer to a person, the bending is not enough because the lens is not becoming more convex. So in order to resolve that, they give a person glasses with convex lenses, right? Or biconvex lenses. And these convex lenses will now bend the light extra for the eye to allow for that vision. We also find that uh, farsightedness becomes more common at an older age, so you'll find that certain people whose eyesight was fine, now they require reading glasses to read uh, text which is close to them. Astigmatism is where the front surface of the cornea is curved more to one direction than the other. So the cornea should be perfectly rounded like a soccer ball, but sometimes we find that that rounding is not perfect and it might be more shaped like a rugby ball. And that would be what we refer to as astigmatism. So here the issue is to do with the shape of the cornea. And as a result of that, we find that the refraction of light is gonna happen at these uneven points. And we find that images focus on multiple points and this can result in blurring of images. And this blurred image is not only at near or far vision, it will be for both near and distant vision. And as a result of that, we find that people can get headaches and fatigue squinting, also eye discomfort and irritation. The treatment is that prescribed glasses can be made if the degree of astigmatism is great enough to cause eye strain and headache or distortion of vision. So to summarize, those people that are nearsighted, they can see near objects, but they can't see distant objects. The lens is too convex or it's remaining convex and not becoming less convex. And to resolve that, we give them biconcave lenses, lenses that are concave on both sides. And you can see that this bends the light outwards so the overbending by the lens will now still result in the image falling on the retina. For farsightedness, the lens is, is not becoming more convex. And to resolve that, we need more bending of the light. So we use biconvex lenses, which will bend the, the light before it reaches the cornea. And then the bending of the eye will be sufficient for it to land on the retina. With astigmatism, if you look at this particular cornea, in this one you can see this is an ideal shaped cornea, perfectly rounded. But this one at the bottom, you can see it's more rounded at the bottom. It's got this bump here and then it's not less rounded on the top. So to resolve this, they can make a pair of lenses which is less rounded at the bottom and more rounded on the top, which compensates for that issue with the cornea. And thus, the image still lands on the retina. The last disorder we'll refer to is that of cataracts. And cataracts refers to the clouding of the lens. So instead of the lens being its normal transparent color, we find that the lens now becomes a cloudy milky color. And the exact reason for this is not definitive. The treatment involves the surgical removal of the lens. So the, an operation will occur where they'll cut and remove this old cloudy lens and they replace it with a synthetic lens with a man-made lens, which will have the characteristics of the original lens. Some of the risk factors for cataract include age. So older people are more at risk of getting cataract than younger people. 
certain metabolic disorders, trauma to the eye, injury of the eye, or it can be hereditary, which means that certain times in your DNA, you might be more likely to have a cataract. Vision with a cataract will also be distorted. This cartoon gives you an idea that without the sense of vision, it will be very difficult to understand what's happening around us in our surroundings. We know that the stimuli around us, humans' eyesight is one of our main sources of input into the brain to understand what's happening in our surrounding. And it becomes very difficult for a person who doesn't have the ability to see. And we should be grateful if you have good vision because it facilitates a lot of the processes that are necessary for us in our daily lives. In the next video, we'll look at the human ear and how it assists us in the process of hearing as well as in the process of balance.